Hi, today we're going to be taking a look at the 1982 OPG ET the Extraterrestrial Trading Cards. Uh, these were bubblegum cards that came out around the time of ET. When ET hit theaters, it was a huge marketing blitz as well. Everyone had learned their lesson from Star Wars. Um, there were tons of ET figures, a lot of figurines, t-shirts, all sorts of things. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff. I had a plushie. I had the deluxe figure where you can extend its neck, you know. Um, I had some sort of weird cologne that was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was perfume or cologne or something like that for kids that um, uh, had a, a great uh, molded figure design of E.T. in a bathrobe. So um, this is the OPG trading card set. We'll take a look at each card. Um, lots of nostalgia here. Uh, they're fairly basic on the back. Um, you know, you've got the design and everything. E.T. looks kind of scary here. Um, and the card series basically tells the story. Uh, E.T. is a weird movie in that a lot of people um, malign it today um, and say, well, it wasn't that good and all that stuff. Um, it was a huge phenomenon when it came out. Um, huge, huge um, uh, box office gross. E.T. himself is not very cuddly looking. I mean, a lot of people say, well, he is. He kind of isn't. He's really, really gross looking. Uh, kind of scary. Um, at one point, E.T. Uh, has some sort of heart transplant or something. And his heart is just like beating um, from within his body. And it's like totally exposed. Uh, this was for kids. There's a, a part in this movie where they show off Reese's Pieces, which um, was a fairly new candy at the time. Uh, originally, the filmmakers went to M&M. &M. Uh, they did not want to to um, have their, uh, their candy associated with the film. I don't know why. Steven Spielberg was fairly bankable at the time. He wasn't the full-blown legend god they use today, but... Um, but back then, I mean, he had Jaws, and he had Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and he had Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I, I don't really know why Eminem balked at um, having their candy featured in this. Yeah, it's a weird, uh, I mean, this is from the movie, but it's probably like a, a full body suit with um, a little person inside. Yeah, so Reese's Pieces is, is around today as a result. It's funny because I always say that E.T. is a great movie to watch at Halloween, especially for the little ones, uh, because, you know, it is a gentle, kind movie about friendship um, from beyond the stars. Um, but the movie takes place in the fall, and there's a whole Halloween sequence in it. And I've always associated Reese's Pieces with fall and Halloween because of its coloring. It's uh, brown and orange, very fall-autumn colors. Um, and this movie. Everyone knows about the E.T. video game. Um, supposedly the game that crashed the um, video game uh, industry at the time. I don't think so, but I mean, it was a lot of money to produce and the game itself wasn't great. Uh, games back then weren't great anyways. Um, there were a lot of uh, arcade ports. So that was, I mean, you know, and sometimes the arcade ports were not great. I think the I think the Atari version of Pac-Man was pretty awful. Um, but, you know, Kangaroo was cool. <laughs> uh, I remember Burger Time being pretty good. So, yes, this was a Steven Spielberg movie. Um, this was originally designed to be a sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, that didn't turn out. The original idea for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the sequel, was going to be a horror movie where a family somewhere in, in rural America gets terrorized by these uh, tall um, aliens that sort of have E.T. heads at the time. In fact, you can see pictures of these things if you look up Close Encounters of the Third Kind sequel. You can see um, mock-ups of what they had in mind. Um, these things were created and abandoned and then later used as a sort of prototype for E.T. So E.T. began life as a Close Encounters sequel. Oh. 
the ride um, at Universal, I think it's around in some way, shape, or form still, um, is sort of a sequel to this. There was also a novelization sequel to E.T. The novelization was basically um, E.T. goes home and is homesick. Um, and there are a bunch of different uh, characters in that book that actually appear in the ride. So the book, the, the novelization of the sequel and the book for e for um i'm sorry and and the ride for et the extraterrestrial are all in continuity pretty cool um the john williams score for this is underrated i feel i always thought maybe superman was his best score because it tells a story and each um each piece of music you can visualize in your head as to what's going on uh but um i feel honestly like a lot of this movie um works because of that uh score uh some people would say that it's um uh and so so movie with an amazing score um the score is 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 uh epic it, it really is uh, if you listen to it i love the piano part um the part where they fly um, which became an iconic part of the movie. That's the thing. Movies don't really have I iconic scenes anymore, but um, E.T. willing um, uh, Elliot's bike and all his friends' bikes to fly um, is an iconic part of that movie. Uh, everyone um, remembers that. And, of course, like their silhouette against the moon um, is iconic. I saw E.T. in a drive-in theater. Um, I don't remember falling asleep to that. I do remember falling asleep to Krull, which I probably saw around the same year. Um, back then, drive-in theaters were a thing. I guess, I, I guess they made a small comeback in the 1980s. I remember the first time I saw E.T., the character himself was on the entertainment section of the Toronto Star at the time. Um, and it was Steven Spielberg posed with E.T. and going on about, like, the Wonderkin does it again and all that stuff. Uh, E.T. was big business, um, making appearances on television and stuff. Um, was uh, parodied and parodied and parodied. Um, E.T. phone home. I can't remember which airplane movie he appeared in. E.T. himself was voiced by an old lady. I can't remember her name offhand, but she was discovered um, just like at a store or something. Uh, and she was a chain smoker and had this interesting voice. <laughs> and, and the producers were like, how would you like to voice an alien? Um, of course, E.T. being the phenomenon that it was, um, appeared in more than just the movie. Also in lots of PSAs. Um, you know, reminding kids of safety, etc. And that lady um, voiced E.T. the whole time. I don't know if they do new E.T. media, if, like, you know, someone else has to try and recreate that, that very unique voice. As you can see, these are English and French. So O.P.G. made um, a lot of stuff that was, um, that was Canadian um, and adhered to our language laws. Uh, newly uh, created at the time um, to include English and French as our official languages. And so, of course, nowadays when you get packaging that's Canadian, um, it's got the, both the English and the French. <laughs> Just going through these quickly. Um, these ET cards you can probably get fairly cheap on eBay. I feel like trading cards and bubblegum cards of the time um, are underrated collectibles. A lot of time you can find whole complete sets fairly cheap and that's good. You know, um, it's not good that they're underrated but it's good that um, as a result of being uh, underrated they're fairly cheap uh, for the most part to get like a whole set of things. Um, there are some card sets that reveal things that were never in the movie. This one's uh, bent here. And other times, like I have a, a G.I. Joe set that I'll, I'll, um, I'll dig out uh, from Impel that um, is part of the continuity of the 
um, Marvel comics at the time and reveal things that are extra from the comics. Trading cards, of course, were part of um, the zeitgeist of products that um, recreated the movie experience at home. Um, and this is before VHS took root um, and the home video market took root. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, comic book um, uh, adaptations, uh, Viewmaster reels, um, those old uh, uh, 8mm reels that, you, that had maybe like 4 minutes of a scene, um, LPs that um, had audio from the movie um, and had a truncated version of the movie, or um, book and record sets um, where you could follow along the movie with um, a, a record or an audio tape, and trading cards. These were all things designed to recreate the movie experience, bring home the movie, right? You know, um, action figures were a big part of that as well. And um, and one by one, they all sort of went away as a relic of the past because um, the home video market took hold. You, you can literally take the movie home. Uh, you didn't need... This is frightening. Uh, you didn't need um, all this stuff to recreate things. So, of course, trading cards sort of went by the wayside. I, I feel like they still make trading cards for things now as a sort of nostalgic callback, but it doesn't serve the same purpose it used to. Um, it's a shame. I love trading card media uh, for these movies. Um, uh, they're fun to dig out and take a look at. I love the experience at the time when I was a kid. Um buying these and getting you got I, I can't remember if this came with stickers but um because i don't have the stickers in this set but um you got you know a bunch of cards and you got um some stickers you know and you can like trade or stick wherever and um a piece of gum and i know people make fun of the gum but like everyone everyone chewed it like everyone uh um you know had those um you know, they, they had uh, flour on them and stuff. They were fairly, like, stiff. And they, they, they had very limited flavoring. Uh, but you'd combine, you know, you get a bunch of packs. And you combine a bunch of gum. <laughs> and, and, and you have a, a giant piece of gum. And you try to blow bubbles. Those things were terrible for bubbles, I remember. They're just so stiff. It's like cardboard gum. But yeah, the experience of getting those packs and, and not knowing what's in them and, you know, the, the, the wonder and discovery of that, um, amassing a large collection of doubles, triples, and quadruples and quintuples and all that, um, you know, that, that was uh, part of childhood for me. And, you know, I know things are different now. There's new experiences, but um, that was, you know, cool back then. And, and all the candy and stuff. Um this is OPG. I feel like Tops was a bubblegum company first and then created cards to try and move the uh, gum, but in so doing became a, became a trading card company. And this is a classic shot of E.T. and Elliot. And here's Elliot realizing he's going to lose a friend. Here's the spaceship, big cosmic chandelier, um, and that sort of design was um, was popularized by Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the other Spielberg alien movie at the time. This is a classic shot as well. Final farewell. Here's ET once again. Once again, I'm I'm amazed that this was such a family friendly um, design. <laughs> I don't know how many kids this would scare nowadays. You know. Uh, we were different. There's some insults and stuff for all the people. I, I can't even say them on YouTube um, in this movie that uh, uh, wouldn't fly today. Um, also, the uh, government agents after Elliot um, with guns 
uh, of course, famously, Spielberg had um, issued a, a recut of the movie for DVD uh, where all those guns are CGI'd out and it's now uh, walkie-talkies. And, um, but uh, he pointedly made a decision to um, include both versions of the movie and not have one, like the new version supersede the old one, like his friend George Lucas. I have that DVD lying around. Um, I never watched that version. I always watched the real one. Here's a behind the scenes. Here's a weird looking ET here. Here's Elliot. Henry Thomas. Who I think went on to have a real job. <laughs> uh, and here's E.T. And next, of course, is the checklist. And someone checked off everything here. Checked off everything. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this walk down this uh, uh, E.T. The Extraterrestrial Opeachy 1982 trading card set. Until um, next time, take care.